So in terms of uh, sort of administration uh, of, of Newfoundland, the, the colonial leg legislature, but before that, a, a, a really a, a naval regime in place. Let's see where we can begin with this. Uh, remember that Newfoundland is a, a giant fishing station at this point in time. Uh, so you've got a population that's spread out all around the coastline. Uh, you don't have uh, little market towns that would have developed around other colonies, around agriculture and, you know, those kinds of meeting places. You really do have a bunch of people living as close as possible to the water, right out over the cliffs. So what do you do with, with all these people? In the early days, uh, the fishing admirals uh, were basically given the right to, to maintain law and order in as much as it affected the fishery. And really that's all that was supposed to be there as far as Britain was concerned anyway. So uh, the fishing admirals, they, they were the first fishing captains to arrive in any given harbor in any given year. So, you know, could be somebody completely different the next year. But for this year, these are the first three who arrived. They're in charge. They get to resolve any sorts of disputes about the fishery and, and uh, you know, uh, I guess trespass and those kinds of things that would have uh, arisen in this particular kind of society. Uh, there, later in, in the 17th century, they also then allowed naval officers to hear appeals because of course you can imagine that the fishing admirals would have privileged perhaps themselves and their own crews over other people who might be complaining about them so there were all those kinds of complaints so the naval officers uh, come in the scene but then there are disagreements between the naval officers and the fishing admirals and so it goes um, the 18th century saw uh, the development, I think, of that sort of more naval uh, 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 system of, of justice. Uh, it, by 1729, uh, naval governors were appointed for Newfoundland. Now, they didn't stay all year. They only came out with the fleet and went back again. But these are now naval governors as opposed to just a naval officer, okay? And they have junior officers who are surrogates. The surrogates go out to various districts around the island and hear uh, big cases. And then there are uh, uh, justices of the peace or magistrates who can be appointed, and they're appointed in all the districts. And they hear the smaller stuff. They take depositions and, you know, they, they, they have the, the, the um, petty trials and whatnot. So you've got this rudimentary system that actually sort of, you know, it's, stumbles along fairly well and the, the, the magistrates are in place, they're local men, they're, and they are men of course needless to say, uh, they're, they're you know merchants more than likely or probably related to a merchant household uh, uh, or the, they, yeah mostly merchants, they could be uh, possibly uh, in later years politicians as well but, but for the moment we'll, we'll stick with the uh, primarily merchants. And they know the local scene and they actually have, they're, you know, they're allowed to tweak the rules a little bit to fit the local communities and you see them doing it throughout the 18th century, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, you get a customs house that comes along, but by uh, the end of the 18th century, uh, there, you know, the, the, you've got a growing colony, you've got more population, the migratory fishery is failing, the resident fishery is ascendant, uh, and so you've got to do something more. So again, you know, Britain is, has been sort of reluctantly dragging its feet, but finally gives Newfoundland its own um, uh, constitution and its own Supreme Court. In the next century, there's even a bigger boom with the Napoleonic Wars in the very early part of the century. Great wages in the fishery, people are coming out hand over fist, and the sealing industry is really taking off. And that gives uh, people a reason to stay on the island for the winter because the fishing season usually is over, and it's something that can be a long winter, twiddling your thumbs. So that, you know, provides even more demand. So finally, uh, you see that in 18, you know, the, 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 the 18 teens to 1830s, there's a big push for reform. And now this is coming from uh, uh, 
Everybody, really. I mean, sometimes there's a notion that it's, it's, it's only a, a middle class uh, liberal movement. But, uh, you know, the working people in Newfoundland want, want the reform, too. They're sort of fed up with this older regime. So by 1825, Newfoundland is finally, finally officially recognized as a colony. And then in 1832, Newfoundland received representative government. So that was, you know, an appointed, two appointed councils and a, a, um, an elected assembly. Uh, they got along so badly that it was called the Bow Wow Parliament. Uh, so they moved to an amalgamated assembly, which was even worse because then they were all in the same room together. Finally, in 1855, Newfoundland received responsible government. So you can see that, you know, it, it caught up quite quickly. Not you know, not having been acknowledged as a colony for so long, once once things started to happen. Uh, and I think, you know, Britain itself was moving away from that sort of mercantilist uh, idea about the colonies and the home country and kind of anxious to push them off a little bit anyway. So it, it worked out that way. Yeah.